Well, welcome everyone um, to what we hope is going to be a really useful um, presentation about applying to Oxford and Cambridge. Um, it's being made by uh, two colleagues from Churchill College, Cambridge. My name is Richard Partington and I'm the senior tutor at Churchill College uh, and I'm an historian by trade. Uh, so I teach history in the, in, in the Cambridge History Faculty um, and as senior tutor of Churchill, I'm responsible for all of the students, their education, uh, their welfare and, and ultimately their admissions. And I'm joined today by my very dear colleague, uh, Sonia Dunbar. Sonia, why don't you say a few words about yourself? Absolutely. Hi. Uh, so I'm a college lecturer in biology with a specialism actually in plant sciences. And uh, within the college, I'm also the admissions tutor specifically for natural sciences, medicine and veterinary medicine. Thank you. Great. So what we're going to do is we're going to share a slide presentation with you. I'm going to talk to slides and uh, we'll take turns talking to the slides but we'll both chip into one another's slides if we've overlooked something or there's something that we feel we ought to clarify or add so it might be a little bit of a bumpy ride here and there but that's that's all good uh, and we hope it's going to be very useful so just bear with me two seconds while i share um, the screen so that everyone can see what we're going to be talking to here it comes great so i'm going to take us uh from the first slide um and that's on, if I can find the right button, no, I need to press the screen first, there we go. Technical hitches are always good. So the first slide is on what distinguishes uh, Oxford and Cambridge from other universities to which you might be thinking about applying. And of course, you'll be thinking about applying to other universities. The UK is fantastic for higher education. There are, in my estimation, 30 or more really outstanding world-class universities in the UK. Oxford and Cambridge are uh, but two of them. Uh, but they are, I think, worthy of a bit of um, uh, special attention um, because of the ways in which they're different from other top flight universities around the world. And what's at the heart of this is the fact that they are collegiate universities. They're universities made up of individual colleges. Every student who studies at one of these two universities is a member of one of those colleges. And there are about 30 colleges um, in each university. What the colleges provide critically is a means of teaching which you don't experience anywhere else uh, in the world at undergraduate level. And we call this teaching supervision in Cambridge and in Oxford they call the teaching tutorials. Um, and what a supervision, a tutorial is, is a weekly meeting in which you sit down with the professors, the lecturers who are teaching your course in very small groups, two or three to one. In my subject in history, quite often one to one, um, having completed work that's been set for you in the preceding week, worksheets in the sciences, usually reading and an essay in the arts and humanities. You've handed that work in on, say, Tuesday night. It's marked by the professors, the lecturers overnight. And then the following day, they sit down with you in these very small groups or, or, or perhaps as an individual and go through the work with you in detail, providing you highly individualized um, feedback um, uh, on your, your learning, um, uh, the quality of the work that you've submitted, how it all interfaces perhaps with the lectures that you've been attending or the labs that you've been completing and giving you guidance for the following week's work. So from the very beginning of your course in Cambridge or in Oxford, in every one of your papers or modules or units or options, whatever you want to call them, uh, you are being set work, you're handing the work in, the work is being marked immediately and you're getting immediate personalised feedback on the work. And you just don't get that anywhere else. And if you're thinking about a reason why you might apply to Oxford or Cambridge, Fundamentally, this is it. And it's organised and paid for by the colleges. Um, so, of course, as in any other university, you go to lectures and seminars and laboratories um, uh, and the like. But the tutorials, the supervisions are, in addition, organised by the colleges um, and uh, largely financed by the colleges. And that's where a key dimension of your learning will take place. So that, that's really the reason why you should think about applying to Oxford and Cambridge because you want that additional and particular sort of learning. The colleges also make things a little bit different in Oxford and Cambridge by keeping uh, your costs very low because they provide you with accommodation throughout your course. It's not quite true of every Oxford college, though they'll provide you with at least two years accommodation, but it's true of all colleges in Cambridge um, that the courses um, uh, um, uh, that you sit, whether they're three years or four, um, uh, involve living in college accommodation throughout. So it's your home. A and it keeps your cost down because you only pay rent for that accommodation when you're actually there, um, which is typically about 30 weeks of the year. So compared with many other universities where you might pay rent for an entire academic year, 
um, 50 weeks or even 52 weeks, in Oxford and Cambridge, you just pay for the time that you're actually there. And that really does keep costs low. And they're among the least expensive universities to attend in the UK because of that. They also offer through the colleges broader outstanding uh, student support, including financial support, great welfare support, of course. But the financial support, although it varies a little bit um, in relatively minor ways between the colleges, is framed in both universities through a kind of central structure, um, the Oxford and the Cambridge bursary schemes, um, where whichever college you're at, you end up with the same core significant financial support, depending on your family background uh, and financial circumstances. One thing that we would stress, though, is that for both universities, you shouldn't worry too much about which college to choose. Firstly, when you apply, you don't have to choose a college. Most people do. Um, but you can submit what we call an open application in which you simply apply to the university and then you get allocated a college essentially on, a, on an algorithmic, a, you know, pretty much a random basis. Um, and the reason that doesn't matter very much is that the colleges are broadly similar. Whichever college you attend, you'll sit the same university course, you'll go to the same lectures, you'll do the same exams, you'll be taught by many or all of the same people. And particularly in Cambridge, you're not even tied to your college for supervision. So while the college organises your supervision, in Oxford, your tutorials, you will go to the most expert people in the university for the specialist options that you're taking. So I, I teach for many, many Cambridge colleges, um, for example. The other reason why you shouldn't worry too much about college choice is because the admission standards in the colleges are alike. Um, the standard is the same and we move applicants about extensively between colleges as part of the admissions process to ensure that the most able people are admitted irrespective of the college to which they've applied. In Oxford they actually move people about before they've even considered the applications. In Cambridge um, you're allocated to your preference college, um, which is one you chose or to which you were allocated through the open scheme. And the preference college then leads on your uh, application process, but it's assessing you on behalf of all of the other colleges as well. And in both cases, about 20% of the students who are offered places are offered places at colleges to which they did not originally apply. And that's a sufficient number to ensure that the academic standards are the same across the colleges. In other words, your college choice is not going to affect your chance of getting in. So you might then say, well, how do I choose a college? Well, of course, you don't have to. But I think we would broadly say um, if you are going to choose between colleges, it's probably a good idea to choose between them on the basis of things like social facilities. That might include location. Do you want to be right in the centre of town or do you want to be maybe a little bit further out where it's quieter, a bit greener, there's a bit more space? Um, do you want a college that's got uh, a very high proportion of, for example, ensuite accommodation or do you want to prioritise being in a college which has got a, an indoor heated swimming pool? If it's the latter, you've got one choice in Cambridge, which is Girton College. It's the only college that's got an indoor heating swimming pool. It's also a bit further out than many colleges. So uh, for people who like swimming, like cycling, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a, a really good option. I mean, I often say to people, think about what you do in your personal time. Say you really enjoy art. Well, maybe apply to a college which has got an art studio in the college where you can leave your easel up, you can leave your sculpture out, whatever it might be. Maybe you're a really great uh, musician, you'd like to play a Steinway grand piano um, every day you want to, choose a college where there is that facility where you can do that, that sort of thing. It really, really doesn't matter. And, and, and most people end up incredibly attached to their own college, whether they originally applied to it or not. So it's not something to worry about. The other things I think that distinguish Oxford and Cambridge are the nature of the courses. And this is very important. The courses are academic, they are intellectual, to a degree they can even be abstract. Um, and that's true even of the vocational courses like law and uh, medicine and veterinary medicine and architecture, they're still operating at quite a theoretical level. And all of the courses are innovative and inspired by cutting edge, high level research, so that you're not going to be studying a course which is kind of time served or stale in any way. You'll be operating right at that point where the academics are saying we're not sure what the answer is. And that's one of the things that makes this study really exciting. So they're probably not ideal courses for people who want to be told the right answer and to repeat it. Really, these are for courses for people who are interested in what the big questions are and are interested in trying to find their way towards the answers alongside academic colleagues who are teaching them, supporting them and discussing with them. And one of the great joys for people like Sonia and me is working with young people who have brilliant ideas um, as part of the teaching process in which we learn as well as they learn. So that's very important, too. 
And the final thing, of course, is because these are among the world's leading research universities, they have to have superb academic facilities, library facilities, laboratory facilities, and the like. There are other very good facilities too in the colleges, um, though perhaps not as grand in some cases as the facilities in big central university uh, buildings in some other universities in the UK. But on the academic side in particular, there is no limit to uh, what you can learn in terms of facility, equipment, and resource. Very, very important. Sonia, anything to add to that before we move to the next slide? I, I think that was very thorough, Richard. Great, thank you. So over to you for the next one, which is about the sorts of things that we're looking for in our students. Yeah, so indeed, as you've just talked about what distinguishes us, I'm then going to talk about what characteristics really define students that we think thrive in that environment you've just described. And one of the first things that jumps out is having a really genuine interest in your subject, a passion to explore more about it, find out more, push the edges of what we know in that area. And we want to see that really paired with an aptitude for uh, that subject. And so we're expecting to see that reflected in your academic trajectory so far. We're normally looking at applications from people that are placed at the top or near the top of their cohort for the relevant subjects for the course they're applying for. And a side note that I think is useful to highlight here actually is that if you're looking on our various websites for the courses and you can see the typical offers there for often the arts and humanities courses and the veterinary medicine course being A star AA and more of the STEM courses so natural sciences for us and, and medicine being two A stars and an A. That is actually often a little lower than the entry profile that we see our uh, candidates come in with. And so I think it's useful to know um, if you're making an application that to be really standing out as a competitive application, we're often seeing STEM subject applicants come to us and enter the college with more like three A stars and our arts and humanities uh, coming in with more like two A stars. We're also interested in traits that might uh, allow you to succeed in an environment such as Cambridge. And one of those is going to be a capacity for hard work. A lot of our courses are intensive and they might be intensive in slightly different ways. In my subjects, for example, we often have long practicals where you're getting hands on with equipment. We have the supervision discussions or you might be spending you know, long hours doing independent research in a library or researching a dissertation. And all of that then requires you to put the time in and spend that focus on your subject. We're also um, hoping to see people with a natural curiosity and ability to do that independent learning, because you are going to need to be motivated to do your studies on your own as you transition to any university. But I'd say the structure of um, supervisions here really brings to the fore anyone who is willing to ask questions and push the boundaries of what they know and what we know in things like supervisions. And this can then all be um, supported by a sort of a good foundation in the subjects that you've encountered so far in A-level or equivalent and good technical skills that are relevant in your subject area. Some subjects may also um, require some vocational commitment. And so a good example of this in my remit would be medicine. We want to see applicants to medicine that have a fundamental understanding of what this profession entails, what this degree is going to lead to and the challenges that profession holds. And so that's something that you can demonstrate in a personal statement, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. Richard, anything you'd like to add here? Yeah, just a couple of things, Sonia. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I think I'd just say that for people thinking about Oxford, the comments that you made about um, grade profiles at Cambridge absolutely apply to Oxford as well. So in Oxford, actually, there's an even wider range of, of in, Kind of you know typical offers um some three a's offers in the, the arts and humanities and uh, of course some two a stars offers in the sciences but the same overall kind of rule of thumb applies around the grade profile of people getting in they average overall about two and a half a stars and it tends to be the majority getting two a stars in the science in the arts and humanities the majority getting three a stars in the sciences and that's not to say that's a minimum entry requirement it absolutely isn't there will be people getting in with lower grades than that every year but that is kind of par for the course for people who are um, uh, from a, a you know a decent educational background where they've not had vast disruption or, or or personal problems where education has gone broadly smoothly 
those are the sorts of grades you should be looking for. And, and, and I guess connected with that, you know, the comment about we're looking for people at the near or top of the cohort. I mean, look around your school or college and, and, and if you want to know whether you're likely to be competitive, say, well, in my subject, I am, am I among the best handful of students? Um, am I among the best, you know, half dozen, maybe, you know, 10 or 15 students in the year group, if it's a, if it's a, you know, a decent sized year group? Um, talk to your teachers. They will have a very good sense of whether you're likely to be competitive or not. And of course, have a bit of faith in your own ability. One final thing I would just add on vocational commitment, as you rightly say, Sonia, very important in medicine and vet and architecture, and maybe to a lesser degree in law and engineering. But quite often people say to us, well, what work experience do I need for history or for geography or for you know, a whole pile of other things? And the short answer is you don't need work experience. Um, for the non-vocational subjects. And actually, it's not even that important in a subject like law. Um, if you can get a bit of work experience, it will probably be interesting to do in the vocational subjects. But for my subject, for history, when people say, well, you know, what about work experience? I say, no, you, you, what will be to your greater benefit in terms of preparing an application would be reading some history books. That's not <laughs> to say that it wouldn't be fun to do some work experience. It might well be, but it's not going to strengthen your application in any significant way. <laughs> So I'm just going to talk very brief, briefly through the information that we look at when we select. So the thing to stress here, everyone, is that colleagues in Oxford and ourselves, when we make our decisions, we're making a kind of portfolio or holistic decision within an academic context. And we're looking at this list of information um, uh, that you see um, on the screen here, um, results in predicted grades, UCAS reference, UCAS personal statement, results in admissions tests where we use them, maybe some submitted written work in the arts and humanities of where we ask for that, which we quite commonly, which we quite commonly do. And finally, interview performance and, and the decisions that we make involve all of this information. It's not the case that you get through all of the kind of things on the top part of the list and get to interviews and then interviews of the decider. In fact, we're going to show you some information about interviews later, which will explain to you why interviews quite often aren't the decider. It's always a composite decision. The other thing I think to emphasize here is just to say that you might look at this list and be really intimidated and think, gosh, how do I manage to be really good in all of these things? That's impossible. Well, the short answer is it's, it's not impossible, but it's very, very unusual. So we've looked at this in both universities. What proportion of the candidates have top scores in every one of these areas? It's about 1% of the field. And we offer places to about 20% of the field. So that tells you that 19 out of 20 of the people who get in have got some dinks on them. There are some things that are not perfect. So if you look at this list and you think, well, I'm pretty good on most of those, it, you know, it's reasonably likely that you will be a competitive candidate, especially if you're predicted the right sorts of grades. Um, if you look at it and you think, well, I've got one or two that I'm quite good on, but quite a lot that I'm quite marginal on, you're probably not going to be a competitive for entry candidate, but you absolutely don't need to be perfect. Just a little bit about um, results and predicted grades, a little bit of further information there. The other things on this list we're by and large going to um, talk to. Um, firstly, what do we mean by grades being appropriately contextualised? What that really means is that we know that the effect of the school that you go to on your results can be significant, especially for your GCSEs. And therefore, when we assess how strongly you've performed, we look at that performance within the context of the performance of people in your school. In other words, we're asking the question through your results and through data that you could ask yourself, which is, am I one of the top people in my cohort? So that's really what we're looking for. Um, we know that from some schools, people will have much better GCSE results than from other schools. The key thing is, in your school, where do you sit relative to everybody else? That's the most important thing. It's true that A-level or the equivalent IB, French BAC, German Abitur, et cetera, is likely to be the final arbiter because we'll make you a conditional offer in which we'll require you to get certain A-level or equivalent grades. On GCSEs, they are a factor in our decision-making but they are not, in most cases, a dominant one. And that's, of course, especially going to be the case in the year 2021 and into uh, 2022, because GCSEs for those years 
uh, of applicants were awarded through centre assessed grades because of the COVID crisis. And therefore, we won't be able to place quite the same emphasis upon GCSEs as we have been able to in ordinary years in which everybody has set essentially the same examinations um, under exam conditions. Sonia, anything to add to that before I throw over to you for personal statements? I think just one thing really, coming back to your point about not everyone having excellence in every single factor. I think you could sort of consider this as a portfolio of yourself that you're presenting to us of these different aspects um, of your interest and your aptitude. And so we're looking for a cumulatively strong portfolio. And that means that we can look for strengths in different areas from these different factors. So I, I'd think about it that way. Yeah, that's really helpful, actually. And of course, it may be that one dimension of real strength compensates to a degree for a, a dink somewhere else. I mean, we, you know, we do see that. I should also say, you know, I've been a, an admissions tutor in Cambridge now for 21 years for a long time. I've admitted students who performed appallingly at interview, um, where everything else in the application was really strong. Um, I've never admitted somebody whose A-level results are terrible, um, but that's, a, you know, that's a, in a way, as we said, you know, the final arbiter is quite often those results. Um, but there will be things that will be, you know, sometimes surprisingly poor, um, but everything else looks really good. And you can, you know, you can see that something just didn't work out in the process. Um, sometimes it's a personal statement, sometimes it's interviews, but usually most people do pretty well on, on those things without being exceptional on lots of them. So over to you, Sonia, for personal statements. Yes, indeed. So one of the uh, one of the key aspects of your application is indeed the UCAS personal statement. And this aspect is assessed in its own right. And you may also find that it ends up being the starting point for questions you're asked if you're invited to interview. When you think about preparing your personal statement, the first thing I would refer you back to actually is the traits that we were talking about earlier that are indicating someone that's going to thrive in the Oxford or Cambridge environment. Your personal statement is your chance to convey your passion for your subject and the aspects that really interested you about it to us. And so one of the pieces of advice we would share is that you want to write with integrity. You want to convey your passion honestly and enthusiastically to us. Be yourself in your writing. In terms of the topics you want to cover, tell us why you want to study at your course. Why are you interested in the course you're applying for? And I think it's useful to note because uh, because several of our topics at Cambridge in particular are formed into triposes, so they can be quite broad. For example, natural sciences, you don't apply for physics or chemistry or biology specifically at Cambridge. Um, but you, within that, will have an area that you're more interested in. And we know that your personal statement will be being read not just by us, but by multiple universities for others uh, in addition to us if you're applying to us. And so we're expecting that maybe your application is majority biology, but also to natural sciences. And there are other triposes this will be relevant for, but tell us what's exciting you about the course you're going for. And you can underpin that with examples from subjects that you're currently studying or have studied um, to show what's led to this interest and that there is a foundation for that interest that you are building. And it's also really good to see you supplement that with things you've read outside of the curriculum at your school. And so we would refer to this as supercurricular exploration. And note that this is distinct from extracurricular activities. So those would be things that aren't linked to your subject, things like I don't know, playing a sport or um, playing a musical instrument if you weren't applying for music. Um, but supercurricular exploration is where you're exploring your subject independently outside of school. And there are a lot of different ways you can do that. We slightly started to talk about this idea actually when um, Richard mentioned the work experience question earlier. And indeed, you know, if you happen to have the opportunity to get some work experience in the area, that is one way you can demonstrate supercurricular exploration. But it's by no means the only way at all. Perhaps instead you're keeping up with the news in the area that you're interested in and you talk to us in your personal statement about your opinion on one particular issue that is appearing at the moment. Maybe you've gone to a local library and borrowed a, a book on a topic, maybe a popular science book elaborating on something you've heard in the classroom, and you want to tell us about a chapter of that that really captured your interest and why. And I think I, 
I'd like to sort of really emphasize actually how we're excited in seeing your supercurricular exploration. We would much rather hear you tell us passionately about your thoughts of page 52 of the book you read and why that was interesting to you, than give us a tick list of titles that you have managed to make a little checklist of. It's not about what you've done as such. It's about what did you get out of it and how does that convey your interest and your passion for your subject? And there are lots and lots of suggestions for how you might do this in many different subjects. And there's lots of uh, resources available online in particular these days as well. And that last point really speaks to this comment of trying to be analytical or reflective. We want to see what you are finding interesting about your subject. And indeed, this is the space in which you can do that. We also often get asked whether you should include extracurricular activities in your personal statement. And the short answer is yes, but we won't be looking at them when we're reviewing your application at Oxford or Cambridge. The reason we suggest you include them is because many of the other universities that you might be applying to may consider them as a factor in selection, but we don't. Um, however, that doesn't mean you should exclude them because as I said before, we know that multiple different universities will be reading that piece you've written. Anything you'd like to add, Richard? Yeah, that was really great. Thanks, Sonia. Um, I guess um, one thing I would just say around supercurricular exploration, um, in the arts and humanities in particular, there probably is no substitute for reading books. Um, and remember, not all, not all books are interesting. Um, just because they were written by a famous professor doesn't mean they're necessarily any good. And in some ways, you know, the, this is the bit about writing with integrity being yourself. The bit where you say, well, I read this book because everybody told me that it was going to be really um, uh, um, uh, compelling, and yet actually there are dimensions of it that I wasn't particularly convinced by, this one and this one, for that reason or this reason. That's where we see you being analytical and reflective, and that's so much more compelling and convincing than somebody telling us that they are really interested in their subject. So um, uh, rather than telling us, what you do through the personal statement is show us, and you yeah. show us by doing the wider exploration, being analytical and reflective, and, and, and telling us what you think. We're interested in what you think. You're interesting people. Um, you're the people who we want to recruit and we want to know what you're thinking about already. So books are really important in the arts and humanities. In a subject like mathematics, it's going to be more about uh, doing more extended and more creative maths problems. Um, uh, quite often the uh, mathematicians say in their personal statements, I've read um, Fermat's last, last uh, theorem by um, Simon Singh, uh, which is an excellent history book. Um, it's about the history of mathematics, but it's a history book. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't read it because it is really interesting, um, but um, you're going you're gonna to do your wider exploration by doing lots of maths. I mean, that's how you're going to do it. And talk about the maths that you like and why you like it, I guess. Um, and I so think it, it, it's been the real you. Sorry, Sonia, I interrupted. I didn't mean to. I was just going to say, and I think on that note, there are loads of fantastic resources with interesting maths problems um, and physics problems to get your teeth into out there that are all free. Yeah, so MOOCs, um, uh, all sorts of online resources available through university websites and the like. Fantastic stuff on YouTube. Um, I, I spend far too much time on YouTube uh, watching videos of animals being friendly with one another, but there is some really interesting stuff on YouTube as well that's academic and critical. Um, I, I guess just one very final quick comment on extracurricular activities. Everybody tells you that, that, that you need them for your university applications. You need to show these sorts of qualities. And, and there are some universities that do look at these things. And when we say we don't look at them, I think there's, there's two things I would want to say. Firstly, um, it's not that we don't care about them. We, most students at Cambridge and indeed at Oxford are perfectly normal students having a normal student life. Um, but there are some students who actually aren't into a wider world, are just interested in their subject. And we want you to, you know, don't feel because you're the person who's just interested in your subject that somehow you're a weirdo and, and uh, you, you know, you're not going to be the sort of person that we're looking for. You're absolutely the sort of person that we're looking for alongside everybody else. And uh, if you come to a university like ours, to any top flight research university, you're likely to find quite a lot of other people like you, perhaps for the first time in your life. So, you know, there is no single university type, everyone. You just need to be really interested, hardworking, exploring, and to have chosen the right course. Sonia, you're going to talk about admissions tests as well, aren't you? 
I absolutely am. So this is an aspect of your application that allows us to look at your academic potential. And so these are fundamentally subject based aptitude tests, and they come in a number of different formats, depending on the subject. And that largely splits between when you actually sit them. So if we talk about that first, a number of subjects will ask you to sit an admissions assessment prior to an interview, and it'll actually take a, a, a key role in selection or shortlisting for interview. So if you're sitting one of those, um, you'll be expecting to sit it uh, sit the exam itself in sort of late October, early November, and you need to make sure that you're registering via your school or college, um, and you'll sit them in your school and college as well, but you need to make sure you register for them um, early in October and the deadlines vary depending on which tests you have. And so some examples of admissions tests that we have at Cambridge that we use um, include the engineering admissions assessment that would be for engineering and also chemical engineering via engineering. Um, we use the natural sciences admissions assessment for natural sciences, but also veterinary medicine and chemical engineering via natural sciences. And then we have others such as the biomedical admissions test or BMAT for medicine and the Cambridge test of mathematics for university admissions or CT Muir for our computer science course. And so I'd really recommend that you have a look um, on the course websites, whether you're applying to Oxford or Cambridge to see exactly what you might be expected to sit, um, because that's just a number of examples. Alternatively, you might be invited to set an admissions assessment at your interview. And so this would be, is, that, is it normally just before an interview? This is more yes, predominantly- Yes, it's, it's normally answer. just before, Sonia, sometimes just after, but it, it's on the day of your interviews. Yes. And it's a Cambridge thing. My understanding is that Oxford don't do this. It's just Cambridge that asks people um, in some subjects where there's no pre-interview test, but not all subjects where there's no pre-interview test to do a test at time of interview. And it, it's basically the same sort of thing more compact, a bit shorter, um, a little bit less formal, but, it, but it's trying to do the same thing as the pre-interview tests. Absolutely, thank you. And so if you're thinking about how to prepare for these admissions tests, there are two main pieces of advice we give. One of them is really understand the format via which you're going to be assessed, because the different papers, the different subjects, evaluate your um, aptitude in different ways. For example, the uh, BMAT paper involves some more essay-like aspects, whereas the Natural Sciences Admissions Assessment is a more multiple choice question based paper. And so the format you're going to need to apply your knowledge in is a really useful thing to know before you sit down and tackle it. The other thing to do is really practice, 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 and make sure you're practicing in a timed environment because these are sat in a fairly time pressured uh, amount of uh, short amount of time and you've got multiple sections to get through and you want to be good at managing your time between the sections. We quite commonly see in the scores we get through people performing much better on some sections than others and that might be due to subject preferences but a lot of the time we also suspect it's down to time management meaning that they spent more time on one subsection and then had less time available for later parts of the assessment. So really try and make sure that you've nailed down the timings that you can afford to give each question, because that'll help you get the most marks out of the paper. If you want to practice these papers, um, there's plenty more information, including all the past papers available via our official websites. Um, so you can download all of that, access all of that absolutely for free and get practicing. And ultimately then, I think it's useful to bear in mind that we're using these admissions assessments to act as an indicator, as I said, of academic potential, but we'll use them alongside all those other indicators that Richard described earlier to help us shortlist people for interview. And also then uh, we use them as well to help decide who we're going to offer our places to as well. Any That's additional cool. comments? Yeah, no, thanks, Sonia. I was just gonna say that I'm conscious that we've not said anything about submitted written work, um, it's an arts and humanities only thing, but everyone, if you get asked to send in examples of your school or college work, the critical thing is to send in something that you enjoyed writing and that you'd be happy to talk about at interview, because it's quite likely that you'll get questions on that written work at interview if you get called for interview. Um, and, and obviously it would be a good idea to take a copy of it before you send it in and to make sure you cast your eye over it again in advance of the interview so that if you do get asked questions about it, you're reasonably familiar with the material and what you said. Okay, great, thank you. 
Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, interviews, and I'm going to invite Sonia to chip in partway through to describe the sorts of things that, that happen in a science interview. But first, I just want to talk about the format of interviews. And I should stress here that um, what I say is absolutely true of both Oxford and Cambridge. Interviews in the two universities are essentially exactly the same thing. Uh, the format is a little bit different, but they are the same thing. They are interactive tests of core knowledge, aptitude and interest. And indeed, such is their nature that are referring to them as interviews at all is arguably misleading. So put out of your mind the idea that this is a conventional interview in which we're going to be making assessment, uh, making assessment of you, the person, whether you would, in inverted commas, fit with you know, the team. Uh, it's not about that at all. It's really just about how good you are at your subject, how knowledgeable and how much potential you've got. I always think the example of mathematics is a really good one here because maths is such a pure subject and it's a really um, uh, helpful way of thinking about what, what happens in interviews and what we're trying to do. Um, in mathematics, you'll um, uh, enter the interview room or you'll join the, uh, uh, the online call if it's an online interview, um, depending on the, the circumstances uh, in the world at the time. And um, of course, the people interviewing you, the lecturers, the professors will say hello to you, they'll welcome you. And then they'll just get straight on with doing maths problems with you. And then, you know, what are they interested in? They're interested in admitting people who are really good at maths. How do they find out how good you are at maths? They do maths with you. It's as simple as that. And, and really that you can, you can, you can uh, broaden that out to every subject. My subject, history, or, or other subjects in which I interview politics, economics. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to um, have a discussion with you about those things, but it's essentially the same process. How much does this person know? Can they apply their knowledge? Are they good at making connections? How logical are they, etc. Now, a typical interview lasts around 25 to 40 minutes, depending upon the circumstances. And whether you're in Oxford or Cambridge or in different colleges in Cambridge, you might have different length interviews and you might have a different number of interviews. It's quite common in Oxford, for example, for people to be interviewed uh, in more than one college. And that might mean that you have three or four or even five interviews, perhaps over a period of two or three days. In Cambridge, you'll just go up for one day um, or you'll just have one set of interviews if they're online um, and uh, they'll be run by your preference college. The most common scenario is that you have two interviews of maybe about 25 minutes each, but uh, it's equally um, uh, uh, possible that you'll have a single interview of maybe 40 minutes. But in every case, the interviewers who will be subject specialists, people in your subject, um, uh, focused upon your subject, they will be there uh, uh, in number, there will be more than one of them, there will be at least two and quite often more than two. So there will be multiple perspectives on how you've done uh, and uh, the way that you cope with the discussion on the problem solving uh, in the interview. And it will be all about problem solving scenarios. In the arts and humanities that will be discursive through discussion. In the sciences, by and large, there is lots of technical working. So especially in a subject like mathematics or engineering, or even in economics, in any of the maths based subjects, you're going to be doing quite a lot of algebra and calculus um, and uh, probably some, some sketching of curves and the like. The questions we ask will require you to think quite hard. If we don't ask you hard questions, we can't really get a sense of how good you are at reasoning your way through complex issues. And it's complex issues that you'll be dealing with at university. You're not gonna be given right and wrong answers by us to learn, you explore with us. And so we're gonna have a go at that with you at interview. And that can mean that it can seem a little bit of a bumpy ride. We'll be extremely nice to you. Um, we'll be very encouraging and supportive, but you won't find the questions easy. And that's how it's supposed to be. So if you come out thinking, gosh, I've absolutely no idea how I did there. I think I did okay on some questions. I think some others I really didn't understand. You've probably done fine. And I'm gonna show you some data in a minute, which will show you that if you did think that, you were almost certainly right. We'll need to prompt you uh, and to intervene at times to keep the interview moving, to help you perhaps get through a little impasse that you've reached in your um, thinking or your technical working. And you may well need to ask us questions. And in particular, if at any point you don't understand what we're asking you to do, just say so straight away. If at any point you, 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 we ask you about something you've not covered on your syllabus, say so immediately. Um, we'll, we'll say, oh, I get you've not got to that bit in the syllabus yet? Fine, we're gonna do another question instead. This is the one that we're going to do. So just be absolutely straight with us all the way through, a bit like with the personal statement, be yourself. Integrity is all, that's, it's really important. 
Um, and it's also very important that you remember that we have no hidden agenda. There are no trick questions. There is no good cop, bad cop. There is no hard man, soft man. Whatever you've read in the newspapers or your Uncle Dave told you about what happened to his mate when he applied to Oxford in um, uh, 1984, you put all of those things out of your mind. It's a very straightforward process in which we're going to go through a series of prearranged problem solving exercises with you. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, stories like, oh, well, you know, he was interviewed by somebody lying flat on their back. The only circumstances that that would happen would be if somebody suddenly had a devastating attack of sciatica right in the middle of the interviews and we couldn't find an alternative interviewer. And we would tell you beforehand that that was the case. You know, no one is trying to catch anyone out. No one is trying to unnerve anyone. We just want you to have a go for problem solving. So forget all of those urban myths. Um, the reality will be much more um, understandable and human and um, real in terms of intellectual and academic exploration. So what do we talk about? Um, our number one choice normally is academic content that you, you've covered in your school or college. Why? Because you've learned it, you should know it well, um, you've discussed it with your teachers, you've discussed it with your friends, there's material there that we can really work with. We will also um, quite often talk to you about your wider reading, your, your wider supercurricular exploration, and this is really important, especially in subjects that you haven't been able to study at school. So you might be applying for something like Chinese studies. You've not done Chinese um, A-level probably. Um, you might have had the opportunity to do, start to do a Chinese GCSE, but you'll be at a relatively rudimentary level in terms of Chinese language. But we would expect you to be interested in China, to have been reading about China, and to be able to talk to us about dimensions of Chinese culture and politics uh, and history, uh, the challenges facing China at the moment, its relationships with the wider world, not in vast detail. But we would want to have a sense that this was actually something that mattered to you. And of course, in subjects like politics and economics, that sense of what's going on in the wider world is really vivid and can be really important. There may be other questions that emerge from your UCAS personal statement that we want to clarify um, with you. Um, a very common question that we ask actually in the arts and humanities in general is what have you been reading recently? Tell us about what you've been reading and what you've thought about. As I said earlier, if you sent in submitted written work because we asked you to, will almost certainly talk to you about those essays at some point in at least one of the interviews if you have more than one. And finally, we quite often use um, what we call prompt material, which is material that you've never seen before, that no candidate can have seen before, but which can form the basis of discussion. So it could be a piece of scientific equipment um, in a natural sciences interview. It could be a set of economic data or geography or economics. Um, it could be a passage of historical writing uh, or some historical documents in history. It, it's likely to be some pictures in history of art, some images of buildings, perhaps, or other dimensions of design in architecture. Um, in English, you'll almost certainly be asked to read a poem. The whole pile of things that we can do, and we can always come up with something that we know no one has, has seen before. It's one of the joys of being in academia at a high level. You can dig something out that's pretty obscure, but which you can do interesting things with. Now, Sonia, would it be helpful, do you think, for people to hear about the sorts of things that you do in a science interview, in a technical interview? Absolutely. And I think um, a decent number of the things that you've just said are actually very similar because fundamentally our interviews have the same purpose, regardless of the subject matter we're talking about. We're giving you an opportunity to show how you engage with your subject. And I really wanted to build on the last point that you were talking about, actually, the part about prompt material, because I think possibly it's actually the most common in the, the STEM subjects, because one of the aspects that you might find is that we ask, we provide you with some sort of experimental outcome or a, a graph of some data and ask you to interpret it and use that as a springboard for further discussion. I'd also really encourage you to bear in mind that you know, it's not just maths that you might find um, mathematical or calculation based aspects appearing in. Many of the more analytical subjects are going to be expecting you to do mathematical manipulations with the data that you receive. And so I think it's quite a common aspect in things like biology, medicine, veterinary medicine, alongside the subjects that you might have more expected it in like physics, maths and engineering. And so I think it, it's really about 
considering the aspects of the subject and allowing you to see um, yeah, different ways of working with this material. And that last point is something, again, I really want to build on. We often base the start of our questions in something that we hope will be familiar to most students. Um, we tend to try and base it in sort of GCSE level content so that everyone's got the same starting position regardless of which um, A-level or equi equivalent syllabus you're doing. But we're going to rapidly diverge away from that because what we want to see is how do you cope with new information? How do you add it to what you already know to come to new conclusions? And it's that process of working through and exploring that we're really interested in seeing. And the reason that we're interested in seeing it fundamentally is not just to see how, uh, how you cope academically, but this is incredibly like being in a supervision at this point. And one of the best pieces of advice I was given when preparing for interviews was to treat it as a mock supervision, because this is exactly the sort of discussion you'd expect to be having in a supervision setting. Yeah, so I would just say on the arts and humanities side, a, a technique that you quite often use would be to take something that you have been taught, take a piece of received wisdom and explore whether there might be alternative explanations. Um, and sometimes that can be quite radical. And, and I think this may be where the idea that we're trying to catch you out may emerge from at times. Um, if you've been taught, for example, as, as you will have been if, you, if you've studied the Tudors, that Henry VII was secure on the throne because he uh, avoided international foreign policy complications, because he uh, kept the nobility on an extremely short leash, and because he acquired a great deal of money, it, it would be understandable for you to be for you to be surprised, perhaps, if somebody like me said to you, "Well, let's think about how each of those supposed strengths may actually have been a really problematic weakness." But that is what we think, actually. So we're not doing it just to play a game to, to play devil's advocate. It's just that you know, in the cutting edge of research. Things have moved on since the point to which the school syllabuses were agreed in 2030, perhaps even more than that years ago. So just just go with the flow, enjoy the interesting discussion so far as you can. And you know, it's an interview. We, we've all been interviewed, whether it's for university places or, in my case, you know, many times for jobs. And uh, you just have to be yourself, and you just have to try and be honest in the discussion and enjoy the discussion knowing that the outcome might go your way, but that in many cases it, it, it's not going to, but that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. I However, think... oh, it's gone, Sonny, say your thing before I move on. No worries. I was say one thing to add as well is that um, we often tell our students in, in the science interviews I've been in that we don't want you to be sort of jarred by the fact we're going to jump topics several times. Yeah. And sometimes people worry that we're changing topic because they weren't doing well on a question, but actually we're changing topic because our subjects are really broad and we know that different people's interests or strengths lie in different areas. And we're fundamentally trying to give a, a breadth of um, possibility really for you to find an area where you can shine and really get into a problem. Yeah, that's really important. The other thing as well, of course, is we are up against the clock. So we do need to keep things moving and that sometimes can People quite often say at the end of the interview, wow, is, that, is it over? Yeah. You say, yeah, yeah, you know, we've been half an hour. They go, Gosh, that, that went incredibly quickly. Well, it's interesting discussion. We hope, you know, we hope, or at least we hope it is, and we, you know, we hope you've enjoyed it too. So what I was going to show you now is some data that illustrates that you shouldn't be scared of interviews. And also it helps explain why interviews are often not the most useful um, tool for deciding who we're going to make offers to. So what you see, oh, we like a bit of data. So what you see here is, um, uh, and I should stress, I'm a medieval political historian, but I like data too. Um, what you see here are data relating to 1,500 Cambridge admissions interviews held in 2015. And the uh, chart in front of you essentially shows what percentage of the interview field achieved which marks out of 10 at interview. Each of those marks has a rubric attached to it. And we use the same interview report form, the same mark scale uh, in every college, in every subject, every year in Cambridge. So 10 means an exceptional candidate. Nine, very strong. Eight, 
strong, worth an offer. Seven, probably worth an offer. Six, possibly worth an offer. Five, marginal for an offer. Four, relatively weak. Three, probably unacceptable at Cambridge. And then two and one, actually, we don't bother defining because you're effectively at the, at the bottom of the scale already. Those of you who um, are good at understanding how distribution curves work will already have seen that this 10 point scale is to all intents and purposes really an eight point scale. Um, if you look at this data, what you will see, I think, really straight away is that two, three quarters, sorry, 75% roughly of the people who are called for interview get marks in the range six to 10. And that means that at the end of the interviews, my colleagues and I turn to one another and say, well, they were pretty good, they're, they're in the frame. And that's one of the reasons why interviews aren't that helpful a selection tool, actually. It's also the case that we know from looking at the interrelationship between how people do an interview and how they then do in Cambridge, in Cambridge exams, that people in the mark range six, seven and eight, which is two thirds of the interview field, are actually equally likely to do well at Cambridge if admitted as students. So although if you get an eight at interview, you have performed better at interview than somebody who got a six, that doesn't necessarily tell us very much. So while interviews can be a factor in final decisions, they're probably only decisive in something like 20% of the total decisions. What they tend to do is reinforce pre-existing information. And where they are decisive, they tend to be the swing factor um, where everything else is evenly stacked between two candidates who we can't separate in any other way. So don't stress about them too much. Um, as I say, remember when you're in that interview or you're about to enter that interview, that there is a 75% chance that at the end of it, we're going to say, well, they were pretty damn good. So, you know, don't worry. All you need to do is do some wider reading, do a bit of revision, um, be commonsensical in the interviews, be yourself, and it's going to be fine. Sonia, talk us through the possible pitfalls, if you wouldn't mind. Yes. So when it comes to thinking about why um, perhaps applicants aren't so successful, there are a number of areas where you may have fallen into one of these pitfalls. One of them is simply applying for the subject that doesn't actually align with your interests or your aptitudes. Sometimes people um, are picking subjects because they've heard that they lead to sort of um, financially stable careers and things like that. And while that is a factor, if your interests and your aptitudes don't align, then you're not going to put together a very compelling application. We're also interested, very interested in your academic potential. And so if your track record in your exams is less strong without reasonable context, or your predictions don't match what we're expecting to see in our field, then we're um, going to see you as a much less competitive applicant than people that do have a strong track record. Poor organisation can really lead to you missing out on registering for key parts of the application process. Um, the deadlines for registration for the admissions assessments and for submitting the whole UCAS portfolio really are hard deadlines. Um, and so you want to make sure you're on top of all the aspects of the application. When it comes to the personal statement and also actually aspects of the interview as well, if you are more familiar with um, the areas around your subject, you've explored them more, then you're going to have a stronger personal statement, a stronger demonstration of your interest in your subject. And that's going to also sort of bleed through into the other areas of your application. Your general wider reading will inform answers that you might be giving, ways you can think about a problem in an interview as well. And so I really, really would encourage you to you know, if you're not already doing it, start reading around your subject because that's going to make you um, a much stronger candidate. Um, we spoke about the fact that actually most people do quite well at interview and you may well come out of an interview unsure of how well you've done or thinking that perhaps it went worse than it did. But there are a few areas that um, can be pitfalls in an interview. And really the main thing is walking in with subject knowledge that isn't as polished as it could be in an area that should be a foundation that you can build on in the interview. So we'd really recommend that you 
go over the the topics that you've seen in your curriculum when you before you walk into frankly that admissions assessment that pre-interview assessment or the interview itself because as um, as richard said very clearly the interviews and all of these different aspects are looking to engage you in your subject we're looking to evaluate someone who's going to be a strong scientist a strong historian and so we're expecting to see a foundation in that topic the other aspects of interviews that I think might be useful to point out is that if we're asking you to try and tackle a problem, we need you to talk to us about the thought process that you're going through so that we can understand how you're approaching it, see the logic that you're using, see the analysis that you're going through. And we can't read minds. So we need you to be able to make that clear for us. You know, maybe you're writing it down on paper, maybe you're verbalizing it. But one of the most difficult things in an interview is if you just go silent and we can't see what you're doing because we also then can't help. And we are expecting when we deliver an interview to be offering prompts and answering questions, further questions that you might have to help you work through the problem. So please do engage with us and don't feel that you have to sort of stick to your guns, st stubbornly working through a problem that you're stuck on. It's not about getting through it on your own. It's about a collaborative experience working through. And it's about it's about running with the evidence, isn't it, Sonia? You know, if, if you've been taught that something is correct, but the evidence that's now being presented to you is strongly suggesting that it's probably not correct, then go with the evidence. You know, use your powers of, powers of analysis and logic, your clarity of thought to lead you to the, the truth, essentially. Absolutely. OK, so I'm going to finish this off just by talking about the things that make a difference to your chance of getting in. Um, uh, the tagline here is hard work, hard thought. Um, we could phrase it another way. We could say, you know, that the, the thing that you really need to be is to be intelligent, to be clever, and to work hard. And if you if you do those things, then you're going to be in with a very good chance. Um, so choose the right subject, uh, and remember that your career prospects later really depend overwhelmingly upon getting a very good degree from a good institution in any subject. You're getting a particular degree that your mum and dad want you to study, but which you're not that interested in, is not going to help you. And you're probably not going to get in for it anyway, as Sonia said earlier. So choose the right subject, number one. Make sure that your exam predictions in particular, um, your track record um, is as good as it can be. Of course, in COVID years, there are some questions about what that actually tells us. But work really hard enable your school to write you the best reference it can and give you the best predictions it can. That will make a difference. As we've said again and again and again, sustained wider reading and analytical thinking. Now, outside the curriculum, expanding your knowledge, expanding your understanding, showing us that you're committed to the subject, bringing something to the party. For admissions tests, you need, as Sonia said earlier, to do some practice against the clock. You don't need to do a huge amount, Four, five, six hours is plenty, but those four, five, six hours will make a difference. And finally, in advance of interview, make sure you're familiar with all of the stuff that you should be familiar with, your A-level course or equivalent, the essays that you've sent in and the like. If you do your best on all of these fronts, your application is likely to be a competitive application um, and you might well be successful. You might not be even Though you're a very strong candidate, because, of course, we have many excellent candidates for the available places and we can't take all of them to our regret. So I would also say that you need to be a little bit philosophical about the process and accept that if you don't get an offer, first, it's not your fault. Secondly, it's probably not our fault either. We've not cocked it up. It's just that it's a difficult competition and we have to make very difficult decisions. And believe me, people like Sonia and I, all of our colleagues across Oxford and Cambridge, we work really hard to try and make good decisions for the candidates their mums and dads and their teachers. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing to do to choose between lots of very good people, but we do it with absolute sincerity and a commitment to doing it as well as we can. But of course, we make mistakes. It's inevitable that we will. And uh, so if you're one of the people who doesn't get an offer, you should probably say, well, it's their loss and it probably is our loss um, without negating from the reality that, that we've worked very hard to make a coherent decision that we can justify to other people. Um, so be philosophical about it, but give it a go. If we're offering the right course for you and you're among the most able students in your school or college, you should definitely give it a go. Sonia, anything for you to add before we come to a close? I think just to actually echo that very last point, um, 
I think a lot of people maybe don't necessarily realize that they are of the academic potential to try and apply to us. And, you know, we're not going to consider your application if you don't put your application into us. So have a go. There are plenty of other um, universities that will be also looking at your application. That's how the UCAS application process works. So yeah, review what we've said, see if you think you're going to make a competitive application and just go for it. And really, when it comes to all the wider reading we were talking about, yes, it's going to make your application competitive, but that's not just for us. You're going to enjoy it as well if you like your subject. So it's a no-lose situation. Great. That's a fantastic note on which to finish. So um, I hope that was really helpful, everyone. I'm really grateful, Sonia. Thank you so much for giving your time to um, uh, help um, make this uh, presentation, uh, which we hope that colleagues in schools and colleges are going to find uh, useful as they're encouraging students to think about Oxford and Cambridge and to uh, start assembling a plan for uh, submitting a really good application. Thanks everyone.